The next panelist on, uh, for this team is the other co-conspirator who helped gin up this idea, uh, Dr. Jerry Hendricks, retired captain, one of the great naval thinkers of today. And Jerry, it's always great to have you back. Thank you. Uh, so I am truly nervous today. Um, so uh, it's, it's one thing to give a presentation on one of your favorite books. It's another thing to give the presentation in front of the author <laughs> of, of some of your famous books. I'm, I'm taking notes. Uh, yes, yeah. Well, Remember, uh, I'm speaking after. Yeah, and, 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 I, and I'm hopefully that you'll end us on a high note because I will never speak after Vandroff again. Uh, <laughs> So I'm in, and uh, and uh, of course I have a story to tell about these 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 coins. I'm I'm responsible for the disassembly of the Constitution to a certain extent. So I'm, I'm glad to get a piece of the of the of the work there. So all right, I'm going to tell you a quick story uh, about how this this happened. So uh, first of all, I wanted to I wanted to say as as a as a Purdue grad, uh, you know, we're happy to contribute to the the space uh, race and and so on. Yeah, as a side, the, the Naval Academy has, I guess, some 52, 54, 70, 80, I don't know, uh, astronauts in space, really good. Uh, Purdue's only had 24, and they're undistinguished names like Gus Grissom, Neil Armstrong, Gene Cernan. Uh, if you really want to go something and get something done, call a Boilermaker. That's all I got to say about that. Um, I want to talk about uh, Honor Harrington, of course. I arrived uh, into the Honorverse uh, somewhat late um, in, in about 19... 97, 1998, I was trying to come up with a series of books. Uh, Penny and I would read to our children in, in bed in the morning, uh, and especially on the weekends, and, and our, our oldest, uh, we would read with her all the time, and I wanted to read science fiction to her on, because she had this fascination with, with dinosaurs and uh, always drifted back to her mother's books, and I wanted to sort of share my universe with her, and I wanted to have some books that were about uh, a young woman in science fiction. So I started reading uh, on Basilisk Station. Uh, but, however, uh, I failed, and, and she's now at David's uh, alma mater at Appalachian State studying paleontology as a junior. Uh, but, but I kept reading, uh, so, so, so Penn won that, that little competition. Um, however, as it was, my tardiness, however, to the books allowed me to indulge without limit for a while, plowing through the first four books in a matter of weeks. Uh, poor me. The period of waiting for the subsequent books, each of which seemed to grow in size. Uh, Basilisk Station was about that thick, and then by the fourth book, it was about that thick. By the fifth book, what were you thinking? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, th these things are, mag uh, anyways. My shipmate suggested at the time that I pace myself rather than rushing through each book as they appeared. Nothing doing, honor became an obsession uh, for me. Uh, for those of you not familiar with the Honorverse, it is a series of science fiction books set, set in the distant future, nearly 2,000 years forward in time after a large outward expansion from Earth. Harrington serves in the Royal Manticorin, or Manticorin. Manticorin. I'm sorry, you know, the audio book yes, reader is going to mess up everyone. That's my fault. Yeah, uh, Manticorin <laughs> Navy, a kingdom composed of three planets that exist in a galaxy comprised of several political military entities. Please advance. So this is Honor and Nimitz, her uh, tree cat, uh, six-lated sentient tree cat. Uh, very important, especially in dealing uh, with, uh, with people who have a cat thing. Um, <laughs> um, which was another reason I thought my daughter would be interested because both of my kids love cats, uh, not so much with me. But if you could go forward one. So this is the, the, the Harrington universe. So Manticore lies at the center of a, of a number of different junctions and wormholes. Uh, there's the, the Solarium League down here where we've all started. There's, a, there's the Haven Empire in the upper right, and there's a number of different. So it's a very complex universe of competing uh, balances of power. These are, these are literally spheres of influence. Uh, so anyways, for everyone familiar with Europe in the 18th and 19th centuries, you'll easily recognize the balance of power system at play. Mr. Weber also uses his pages to explore various political philosophies. Corruption abounds, but so does the concepts of duty and honor, which leads us to our hero. In the first book, the reader finds Harrington proudly commanding her second hyper-capable warship, 
under difficult circumstances. They make note of the fact that uh, for every hyper-capable command, she gets a little, put a little extra dot on her uniform. So I wanted to go ahead today, I, I've worn my little dot on my uniform from my at sea <laughs> command. Um, and, uh, and so under difficult circumstances, I'll proud to command a light cruiser of a relatively young age. Uh, Harrington is, is relatively young, but everyone seems to be incredibly old in these books because of Prolong, uh, a, a treatment which remarkably extends the lives of its recipients. The commander is somewhat burdened with improvements uh, added to her command by Vice Admiral Sonia Callsign Horrible Hemphill, the, charable, the chairman of the Weapons Development Board. And, and this, is really, this is really where it gets juicy. As an acknowledged leader of the Jean École, or the new school, or the young school, uh, within uh, the Manticoran Navy, Hemphill has caused a gravity lance, uh, which looks remarkably like a ram on, on a ship that we may have fielded back in the 1880s and 1890s, to be installed on honors light cruiser, the HMS Fearless, with, which is capable, the ram, the gravity ram, uh, our gravity lance is capable of collapsing the nearly invulnerable sidewalls of an enemy ship. The lance comes with certain drawbacks, namely that in order to make room for it, most of Harrington's main missile and laser armaments had to be removed, and it took almost all of her ship's power to operate it. Weber, of course, is adapting the actions of the French Jean Ecoule Strategic School of the 1880s and 1890s, which sought to offset the British advantage in battleships by investing in torpedo boats, rams, and fast commerce raiders. The sense of offsetting technological approaches as a means of overcoming the numerical or material advantage pervades the early Harrington books as the Manticore, as Manticore faces a numerically superior force in the Republic of Haven's Navy. Long story short, Harrington enjoys a major success with her ram during the initial move of a major fleet exercise but that success made her ship a target in every subsequent move of that exercise. Her crew emerges from, the, from that, uh, that war game demoralized, and Horrible Hempel is pissed at the failing <coughs> CO after such a promising initial success. As a result, Harrington finds herself exiled to the backwater Basilic Station. Next. Uh, back one. There. So if, if, you, if we go from the previous one, one more back. So this is the, uh, the wormhole junction. Please go forward one. So Basilic is up here. It's sort of at the, the far backwater reaches of this, uh, of this system that's been described. Um, so let's see. Uh, the wormhole junction that serves as a choke point for galactic trade with a very disgruntled crew. Upon arrival, Harrington finds herself alone as a senior officer in the region. As, uh, as a truly despicable person, uh, the, the senior officer there, uh, who leaves uh, her somewhat in the lurch to head off home to get his ship refit, and then Harrington finds herself in the midst of a, of a major war there. I must pause to say that the science of the Honorverse is remarkably coherent. Whereas Star Wars will sprinkle a magic pixie dust called dilithium crystals all around the engine room, <laughs> and Star Wars fly, flies about the galaxy in unicorns named Millennium Falcons, <laughs> Weber throughout his books takes the time to explain in great detail alpha and beta nodes, go ahead, one forward, alpha and beta nodes, propulsive wedges, their accompanying sidewalls, as, my, as well as my favorite, the Warshawski sails and goes on to, into explanations about gravity waves, tying them all back into a concept that emerges from Einstein's attempts at a unified field theory. It all holds together remarkably, and what emerges looks like Great Britain's Royal Navy in the age of Nelson in space, except rather than having a line of battle, the three-dimensional nature of space allows for a wall of battle. Next slide. A fleet made up of everything from destroyers, light cruisers, cruisers, battle cruisers, battleships, dreadnoughts, and super dreadnoughts. The former ships are considered to be part of the screening force, while the latter larger combatants are considered to be wallers, or parts of the wall of battle. Before going on in my talk, I'll also state the concepts of trade, commerce rating, ship maintenance, training, logistics are also covered within the books in great detail. So where was I? Oh yeah, Harrington and the Jean Nicole. For most of the series, Harrington and the Weapons Development Board pretty much have a hate-hate relationship. 
as Harrington and her mentor, Admiral Hamish Alexander, tend to battle against Hemphill and her perpetual encouragement of the Good Idea Ferry. What Harrington and Alexander seem to desire is a stable production lines of established designs in order to build up the fleet quickly for war against the enemy system of Haven. Alexander argues for capacity. Henthel argues for capabilities. This dynamic technological tension that runs throughout the books, the strain between those of the traditionalist school who want to move ahead with new technological investments and experiment time, experimentation in a time of war, and those who want to preserve stability and current advantage. As I said, Harrington seems to align with Alexander, the leader of the traditional historical school that believed that fundamental truths did not change, that new weapons should simply offer new and better ways to apply those truths, and not that they could create new truths or new ways of fighting, That's actually your exact words, um, in the beginning. But after the introduction of a new innovation that radically changes her approach to battle, the toad pod, Harrington undergoes a change. The pod is a missile pod that can either be carried internally within the ship or and rolled out during battle or towed behind a large combatant with a minimal reduction in its acceleration and overall net speed, then cast loose during battle to launch its load, its overwhelming load of missiles. These pods allowed for a significant increase in the volume of fire, especially in initial moves in battle. Harrington immediately appreciates their significance and uses them to great advantage while commanding a squadron of merchant Q-ships in pirate-infested space. This was a great book. There, also, there are also other innovations that come out of the board that are worthy of note. More effective electronic countermeasures, faster than light communications devices, and drones. Following her tour as a Q-ship squadron commodore, which was what we in the Navy would call a gut check punishment or get well tour, <laughs> Harrington serves for a brief time on the Weapons Development Board where she authors a report recommending a number of investments, go ahead and go through, to include what we all would recognize as a space aircraft carrier. <laughs> She receives her Commodore's broad stripe during this tour and returns the fleet to take up command of a cruiser division within Hamish Alexander's 8th Fleet. This sets up one of the most interesting encounters of the entire series to me. I must say that one of the great characteristics of our guest, Mr. Weber's books, is that they do a great job of illuminating some of the larger debates of the post-Enlightenment era within their pages. Are you interested in a debate regarding a secularized society versus a religiously based society? Well, read Honor in Exile. Would you be interested in a dialogue regarding socialism versus capitalism and their effects upon society? Read On Basilisk Station. How about academic idealism applied to diplomacy versus pragmatism in foreign relations? Then you must read The Honor of the Queen. How about the balance between individual freedom versus responsibilities in society? Read them all. I must also say that Navy value, values of honor, courage, and commitment are ever-present as well as duty. There is always duty. Mr. Weber uses both situations and dialogue to illuminate the issues under consideration. I only wish that I could get my graduate students to engage in such vigorous exchanges in class as what exists in the honorverse. However, in the case in question, the debate regards the balance between innovation and rapid change within the military versus adherence to established patterns and norms, and it is presented with great forcefulness and even passion. It begins with Admiral Hamish Alexander, the Earl of Whitehaven, having escaped a large reception at Honor Harrington's Steadholder Estate on the planet Grayson. Okay, so the whole story about how Honor becomes a landed Steadholder and a member of a royalty on another planet is really, really good, but I can't get into it now. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, Alexander has gone to Honors Library to contemplate a number of topics to include the latest report and recommenda recommendations of the Weapons Development Board, uh, which include, among other things, an entirely new class of super dreadnoughts to carry the large number of pods internally, a new space aircraft carrier, the construction of a new class of electronic warfare drones, and Harrington, who has been made of, aware of where the Earl is sitting, uh, goes to visit him there. Mind you, until this moment, their relationship is very much between a senior and a junior, mentor and mentee. But when Alexander goes off in a knee-jerk negative reaction about the new weapons board uh, report, 
which he believes is another Sonia Hemphill disaster waiting to happen. Uh, he, ends up, uh, he ends up by stating that the board's recommend recommendation wasn't just jumping off your horse midstream, it's jumping off without making sure that you have another horse to land on. Harrington brings him up short. It's kind of a real awkward moment uh, because she uh, reminds him that she's the principal author of said report. So there's sort of this real silence in the room at that moment. And then accuses him of not having read the necessary appendices. And God has that never happened before. <laughs> In doing so, Harrington informs Alexander that everything uh, that had gotten to fleet to where it was will not be enough to take it forward. The enemy had a vote and was casting it, and if the Manticoran Navy was to retain an edge, it would need to invest in new technologies, new concepts of operations, and new strategies. In doing so, Harrington adopts a high-low approach without actually using those terms. Instead of recommending a wholesale changeover from older platforms to newer ones, as Lord Jackie Fisher had in the British Navy during, in the early 20th century, she recommends restructuring the fleet differently to place new technologies at the heart of battle while making use of older platforms elsewhere within the campaign where they could be of use to effect. The exchange leaves both individuals changed dramatically in their estimation of each other in many other ways, and they emerge from the library at the end of their conversation as equals. I cannot help but say that this debate has greatly informed my own approach to our current debate about fleet structure and design. Let's go ahead and next one. There are some now who have argued that we should not build one new ship beyond what is already planned prior to fully funding maintenance, readiness, and research and development of new weapons and new platforms. While I agree that maintenance and readiness should be fully funded, I also think it should also be fully defined so that we can understand what fully funded actually looks like. I do not agree, however, that no matter how much I respect some of the proponents of the third offset Jean Ecole school that exists today, that we can afford to place all of our bets on the next big thing. The Navy is not Apple, and we are not being led by Steve Jobs right now. But nor can we turn a blind eye to the constant advance of technology. It is clear that the Chinese much of the Republic of Haven did in the honor verse have recognized that our technological advantages and have moved to duplicate or negate them. Therefore, we have no choice to take honors path and carefully invest in new research and development initial initiatives while also continuing to build new ships. I can tell you that Horrible Hemphill goes on to moderate her views and isn't so radical in the later books. Alexander, in turn, comes to embrace, among other things, many of the new technologies and their implications for the fleet strategy. Harrington serves as the bridge between the fleet in being and the idealized, idealized fleet of the future. It is much needed and a strong bridge and one that we need as well today. Harrington's balance between the capabilities inherent in pods, EW drones, and lack carriers on one hand and maintaining growth rates in the fleet to build capacity to serve inform my own thinking in this day and I can tell you that if you ever hear about a toad pod in our Navy, you can bet I will be there encouraging its development. And the last thing I want to say is, in the case of uh, there's any question of where we need to be going, keep calm and roll pots. 